So yeah, <clears throat> welcome to a little um, talk about um, details of ODF, which is um, uh, all about how to uh, save, transport, serialize, and then read again changes, like for change tracking, like changes to a document. I thought I did. OK, um, <clears throat> so. Um, this is a, a GSOC project that's been uh, sponsored by Google. Um, that's the, um, the cast, the, um, the student, Rosemary. Um, for, uh, for a variety of reasons, unfortunately, the project did not um, fully finish, but it's in a state um, where uh, export um, the export part of that feature works reasonably well so that we can demo that here. The import part is um, still a bit lacking, but um, this talk is mostly about like the, the general concept, why it's useful, um, and also like showing that it's implementable, how it's implemented, and what's already working. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, for, for Google for sponsoring that. There's a link to the, to the feature branch. Um, to the code that's in the repo. Um, yeah, and with that, I hand over to Swante for some pet talk. Thank you. Um, so change tracking is just, or this way of doing change tracking is just one incarnation of um, a very new feature. And I'm hijacking this session a little bit to explain the, the very new concept that is uh, very, very important. So. I claim that documents are not sufficient alone to have an interoperable collaboration, yes? So and I, in the following slides, I'm going to show you what is missing. This is, by the way, Titan, Titan the god um, that is um, Atlas, that's his name, um, who was condemned to uh, carry the world, the sky. And so documents are no longer to, uh, to apply to all things. They are coming from a different time. And there has to be some change in perspective. So what is missing? And um, when I ask the customer what is missing, then the customer usually says, this is a quote that is uncertain if it's very true from Henry Ford, the inventor of cars. But if you, ask, if you would have asked the customer what do they want at that time that only carriages, they ask for faster horses. But you know, you notice that um, the customer is very, in general, very linear thinking. So um, faster horses. In terms of collaboration, from the ancient times, when we did collaboration, when I did collaboration in, in high school, we, we had a floppy disk. So um, we have now faster floppy disk. It works. Check. We have faster floppy disks. Floppy, floppy disks. We have now email. We can attach files to it. And we have only now even cloud space. We have uh, shared directories, which is even more faster. It cannot get any faster, I believe, right? But we still have a very, very huge problem in per se not solved. And that is you can only edit one at a time. There can only be one editor, right? It's just like this old movie. There can only be one. And you have to somehow have a pessimistic lock for the, um, the only one can be there, yes? So there might be. When there's a disk, you, only one can have the disk. And please, everybody save to the same file. We don't want to have any problem later on, yes, and having end up with, with multiple files. And that is exactly what we have. We have a merge problem. That is the basic thing that is still lurking around and that is not being addressed so long. So there are two use cases. The upper one is the, from the customer, and the second one is from the software vendor. So the upper one is that most of you as a user felt like, if I have this presentation or any document on this floppy disk and I hand it around or send it by mail, and you're starting to, to check it, annotate it, or edit it, and give it back to me, then I'm having all these bunch of floppy disks on my table and asking myself, what is the difference to those, to, to my original? Because I want to, um, in the end, I want to have one, one file in the end. So I have to merge back all the changes back to a single one. And that is exactly the, the, the key questions. What has been changed? Yes, especially when I'm, um, for instance, working with a, with a lawyer. 
um, lawyers used to have um, different market leading office application. So um, they don't support change tracking in ODF at the moment. And so I have no way to, to understand what is being changed. If I'm now switching to, to different format, then I'm still only able to have this called what I have change tracking. You have to enable it explicitly. And what happens if they forgot at certain times to enable the, certain, uh, the change tracking? And um, important things were um, going under the radar, yes. What I usually do is I print it out and hold it against the light and the sun to see, oh, is there anything that is being changed, right? But this, is, uh, this should not be the case in general. It does not scale, okay? So just a second. Um, so the problem is um, how can we guarantee how we merge it? That's a common user case. And the software case is um, at this time where the internet is all uh, ubiquitous, you are asking yourself, how can I collaborate instantly with the others, right, um, in an interoperable way? And the problem is the only thing that is standardized is the file format, the, the complete document. But it does not scale if we send the file, file format around in real-time collaboration. The longer the file there gets, the, larger, the longer it takes to, to pass. So um, we have to do, it's obvious, to send only a change, but we, we don't know what a change is. And change tracking usually happen. Um, tracking changes what you know what, don't know what it is. It's, it's funny to, to track something that you're not aware of what it is. It's just like simply, oh, there was a change, I do it in a black box, yes. And if you reject this change, I put it back. And this is what we, what we try to change. So what are the requirements of a merge? And um, a merge, it's similar to software. It's very, very similar, and uh, there are parallel, parallels. So you have to know what's the difference. You find out the diff, what it's called. You have to, when you want to merge together, you have to know how you get from this document A to document B or to the version AB, right? What, is, what are the steps? And I would like to decide on each step, do I like to take it over or not? And the last thing, of course, which is lacking the most is interoperability. There are a lot of solutions like Google Docs, Office 365, or LibreOffice Online, but they cannot collaborate together. There's no interoperability. I claim that every single, single one of these uh, interoperate, uh, sorry, every single one of these collaboration solutions are some kind of lock-in. There's you cannot exchange or combine them, right? Either with um, with with other editors, nor with business software, which is a large problem here. So. Um, so I give you an example. How does it work? How, what we are doing? So we have um, we standardize the changes of a user, and what we are trying to do with with the ODF changes, we we look what are the common changes the user has, and. We came from a problem of real-time compilation where there was a web browser and at that time it was StarOffice. How can we switch changes that both of them um, can put map to their model? And the, highest, the best thing was to go on a semantic logical level to say what the user is changing, what, what every Office application is doing, like inserting paragraphs, inserting text, formatting, selection. So and the nice thing on this high level, logical level, is that as there's so little noise when you compare them, yes. In XML, when you make a diff a comparison of this, there can be a lot of differences without being something different at all in the logical sense. For instance, uh, sometimes the uh, document is in one line, sometimes there's a different indent, um, sometimes XML might have a different prefix, and so on and so on. There are a lot of things that can change, but are just noise that, um, that keep you from, from the real difference. So uh, we have this high-level abstraction, and this, uh, what you said now, is the, this logical thing. Another benefit is that um, different applications used to have the same modelization on this logical aspects. So it's very, very easy to, to um, integrate. And the last thing that's very important is it's in quite of an atomic change. There's no influence. We have on this, um, do we have a pointer, by the way? On the right side, we have a stack of, um, of um, changes. So first, we add a paragraph, and in the second three lines, we have uh, different parts of steps. You go from the start of the beginning, and it's just like you're reading a batch script, or it's like a stack of cards. And um, so, and on the left, you see the ODT document. And what we're doing here is simply we're just going, we're just inserting the heading here now, and the other things like um, the. Let me have a look if I can do it. You don't have a mouse. Okay, we don't have a mouse. Okay, sorry. <coughs> but um, some we have now uh, several items you can simply count through, like uh, the one to nine is a paragraph, second paragraph, 
These list item one is the third paragraph, item two is the fourth, and the image is the fifth paragraph. So you can easily look at this and point to them um, by, by a convention that we are building up at the um, level. And the nice thing, it works for other formats as well. So on the right side, you see how it's in JSON. JSON is a serialized text format that is um, quite often used in the web. And as we used it for our web office, it was um, the state of the art. And in the specification, we want to uh, standardize the JSON and the XML, which is being used to uh, start in the zip. Torsten, would you like to show uh, the example of how it can look like in the XML? Yes, we'd love to. So <clears throat> um, this kind of this was in, that was in the abstract. And now let's see. So I can get some <clears throat> some demo going. So um, this here is um, it's a very simple document, and what you can see what, what happened here is a, um, a, a simple change. Like this second paragraph got deleted. Um, so um, this is um, <clears throat> the development build from from this feature branch. That contains the um, the GSOC changes, and if you now go and look at the XML, so uh, just so how this is implemented, this uh, this is a um, is that visible reasonably. If not, just come closer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So the, the XML, um, the DODF container is a zip archive, as you know. So there's a number of XML files, content XML, settings XML, styles XML. With the um, uh, prototype implementation, there's another file called undo XML um, that contains uh, reverse changes. So um, the, the final state of the document is always in content XML. So whatever you use as a consumer application, it will always show the last state of the document. And then backwards from this last state, there's an undo, let's, set of undo actions conceptually stored in this XML file to go back in time. And <clears throat> that's what um, currently is serialized with, um, with this prototype uh, with a simple change like deleting one paragraph. So let me highlight that. This is Office undo, then this is Office change with, uh, oops, some, uh, the problem is uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details of how I hate NVIDIA Optimus and how it doesn't work with Linux, but <clears throat> anyway, I hope it's still um, visible here. So there's a text insertion. Now when I go like this, it clears it up. Um, with a um, position, so uh, let's say a relative positioning in the, um, in the, not in the XML tree, but in the conceptual document object um, model. So it's the, just want to help me out, it's the second paragraph from the top, and what's the one? And the one is the first character within the, the child of the second paragraph. Okay. And, and this is the meant that because it's of the type text, you insert in just the text that we read here. Right, so the final state of the document is without the second paragraph. I mean, it's still, if you look at the, if you look at this, it's still there, but it's crossed out. So if I then go for um, track changes, whoop, and I don't display them, then you see it's gone. So the, the final content XML does not contain that paragraph. So to go back in time, I have to insert it again. And that's what this, this markup does. So it says insert. This is the second paragraph at paragraph position one, uh, two, character position one. So you can go back in time. Um, compare that with, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, previous or with the current uh, ODF markup for that, which is inline. So this is content XML. And all the change tracking information is in line. So it's um, inter interleaved with the actual document content, um, which is OK. Um, it's just um, it has a number of drawbacks, one of them um, that every consuming application needs to implement that and skip that. Uh, and secondly, it's, um, for example, if you want to sign a document, 
and then you want to edit uh, or make, make some amendments, um, you cannot because you would break the, the signature. But what you can do with, a, um, with the um, separate change tracking is to just add it on top and have a second signature signing off just on those changes. And that, that makes a number of things very, very easy, even if you exclude stuff like real-time collaboration. But, but even just, just having that separate uh, out-of-line, off-band off is, I think, quite nice and helpful. Um, Back to you. Yes, just, just leave it a little bit, because that's very, very important here, what you just uh, mentioned. Earlier, we had, um, because we have no way to identify something um, or to point to it, um, we, we had an ID in the middle, and uh, we had to uh, put an ID, and the content, the previous content, was always also in the content XML. So when you're looking for the changes, you had to pass the complete content XML, even if it was a very, 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 very large document, right? But nowadays, you can put it aside in an own file because we have the ability to, to point by convention. We know what to count, yes, these logical blocks. And um, so this gives us um, new abilities, right? And this feature about do we need an XML or an ID is one of these things that has been discussed on large. So I continue? Uh, yeah, let me find the slides. Um, where were we? We were just uh, that one here. OK. So we are decision making problems. So when you work in a, in a team, there are a lot of people with different opinions, and sometimes the opinions just um, yeah, are based on personal taste, right? Like uh, we most know that the Pink Panther with blue and yellow, and it goes around and around and around, and just said we can l watch this movie <laughs> over long. But um, the thing is, how do you make a decision based on um, these advantages? And the rule of thumb for making this is um, the more feature set we are covering, the more use cases, the better it is, right? XMLD has their, has their advantages, especially where everyone comes up with, oh, hashing, we are so fast with it yet. But um, the things like Torsten said, we are not able to put something aside. We're still breaking the document. And um, think of other scenarios that wasn't possible um, in the past, like there's a read-only document in the internet, you can take a look at it, and then you want to comment something, right? But uh, nowadays, you would have to re uh, load it, edit it, and send the document back, because it was only possible to send everything, this, the full document back. But nowadays, you can have a small set of changes and point within the document, and you make something like, in Git, the developers know it, like, like a pull request. You ask, them, do you like my changes? Would you like to take them? And the guy does not receive the complete document where he doesn't know what has he changed. He just receives the changes and can read it even by um, yeah, manually, humanly, and said, oh, he just changed this text. This is totally safe. He doesn't break my template um, with another application or makes something wrong. Uh, we can take it. It's safe, right? So this is, this is very, very um, important. OK, um, how does it look like? How does an architecture might look like? And I worked for, uh, um, before for Open Exchange, which is, um, had a web office. We started with this. And uh, there the common uh, use case was the following. On the server, the ODT was transformed to a sequence of changes. Just a different look at the same thing. It's like the sequence of changes like um, a batch, how a user would create the document from the top to the end. Like, um, yeah, ma long macro script or a recipe. And this, then, this is sent to the browser, and the browser will then create the document from the beginning to the end um, based on the sequence. And the nice thing is the browser doesn't know, was it a file or was it from a different user who just sent me the thing? So he only had to care on these changes, right? It's, it's very, very fine granular. And um, it's just like you're getting the the ODT out of the, um, out of the uh, equ equation there. OK. So what's next? What's finally to do? And um, it's a little problematic because um, LibreOffice developers currently not, I say, they, they're not cheering for this new change tracking because the downside, I didn't realize it at first, is that although change tracking is required, there's a lot of effort to spend there, and for the user, it's quite the same. It's only changing for the change tracking feature itself behind the scenes. There's no benefit a user would pay for, right? So this is hard to sell for people who 
have to sell the developers, so we have to come up with different features. And um, I work in a different area on the um, Apache ODF toolkit. That's what um, what's being used in the back end. To I call it the ODF sequencer because it uh, takes the file the document and maps it to a sequence and then later you can get um, some changes as well in another sequence and apply it back to the file, right? So um, it takes all the complexity of this ODT out for you. And um, this is a new feature that's going to be added in this incubating uh, Apache ODF toolkit project. And, um, and the next thing of course is something that LibreOffice helps. It would be nice to have this for testing because currently we just load documents to LibreOffice to see if we're crashing, and it would be nice if we're saving and see if the feature set have changed. And because I've did the same thing for my regression testing fonts, I know that once you have a bug, you still want the test running, and you need to adopt the references, and you need some tooling for that. This is something to Michael, do with. Michael, you, you did pretty much that, I mean, to, I mean, on a different level of abstraction, but with this diffing, like normalizing and then diffing, Right. I would love to. And the last thing, um, I mean, the next thing, it's just based on that, on top of this uh, tooling that is required. Um, you know Git, perhaps, you know versioning systems, and currently, if you check in any ODF, then it's just a binary file, and um, it's hard to, to see the differences. And even if you make some tricks and get the XML, there's a lot of noise, you can get not stable versioning. But if you work on, on these changes, on this high-level abstraction, um, you can see these changes and you can merge changes very easily. So um, this is something I'm, I'm going for because this is the first, I think, the first use case where customers might say, oh, that's nice, I would like pay to pay for this. So we get some momentum with this because it's uh, um, quite stalling. So this is which I can do mostly alone. Um, change tracking specification is already, there needs, there's a need of implementation, and LibreOffice is the largest ODF of implementation, of course, needs to be on board. Otherwise, it's, um, yeah, lifeless, fruitless. And um, what we are, what this topic about was this change tracking in this area, this have to be implemented, it should be implemented, otherwise, um, yeah, we have a problem. And independent of it, there are some old anchors to, um, depths from Star Office about format this is just for the developers, which have to be addressed as well. Like um, if you have bold letters and you um, make a change tracking within the text and make something underlined, and you're not able to undo it. It doesn't work with the application core nor with the mo um, ODF model. It's, yeah, that is broken, have to be fixed. There's an ISO block and uh, area, um, especially in writer to, to touch that. But that's kind of orthogonal problem. I mean, that, that probably needs addressing anyway at some stage. Um, but it's orthogonal to how you serialize um, the, the, the actual change track information. So, um, yes, yeah, so again, thanks for uh, Roses for doing wonderful work here. Um, I hope that at some stage we can uh, complete that and at least have that as an experimental feature add on in master. So, uh, Roses, thank you. And with that, that is one to... Uh, yes, last slide, this is for Michael Meeks, because we have some um, little dispute on this. No, um, this was not the last one. The last one, one <laughs> that one, I believe. Or the last one of mine slides, okay. So, oh, wait a minute, we've got a yeah, random problem here. Uh, I'm going to fix that. See, it's fixed. All now. right. So, we have to remember to group up and to play smart. It's, um, yes, we, it's not sufficient to be open source, in my opinion. Um, we, we LibreOffice all, LibreOffice should still support ODF because it's, ODF is um, with LibreOffice the biggest player, or other way, LibreOffice the biggest player of ODF. And there are a lot of marketing effects by, um, by an ISO. And we see it by the ways that Microsoft, um, oh, the things that Microsoft did when ODF ISO came up, um, they created fully new format, quite similar to the one that ODF did. And they even took over the name. It was uh, the first alpha version of ODF called Open Office XML, but the name was changed because it was too application dependent. It should be um, something that like uh, Collabora, uh, not a Collabora, like other, Abbey Word was it, yes, and others should, should use the format and uh, they should, um, it should not belong 
it's clearly to one to an application. So the name Open Office XML was dropped, and Microsoft took over Office Open XML. Just switching the first two words, it confused me totally in the beginning. But um, and it's also apparent that um, they have to move certain steps if. The, if we open up the market. And the next step is in interoperable collaboration, in my point of view, because one of the, the largest um, blockers for getting to the enterprise market is the business software, enterprise software, which is highly dependent on the Microsoft API. And if there would be some, let's say, document API, some document changes that are interoperable, like you can put the ODF directly to the Git, and you get this, uh, these changes and can put them directly into your, uh, into your viewer, into your business software that you're writing. So um, you wouldn't no longer necessarily ex have to exchange this ODF documents, but these changes, right, to, uh, to allow mergers and real collaboration, like user, customer desires most, then we would have something there that would push the market again. So, group up, play smart. Thank you for listening.